My friends, we're witnessing a major guerrilla war in Myanmar, also known as Burma. Pro-democracy rebel forces and ethnic militias launched multiple sequential offensives, codenamed Operation 1027, 1107, and 1111. This three-way offensive presented the Myanmar military dictatorship with their most serious battlefield challenge in at least 30 years. Of course, we'll also take a look at how the Myanmar army deals with the situation, and we'll also explore their modern counterinsurgency tactics. Uh, let's just say they had their own interpretation of winning hearts and minds. You're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? Are we the baddies? Now, what is tragic is that many of these pro-democracy fighters are really young. Not too long ago, most of them were students. Some still wear their school backpacks while firing machine guns in the same university they attended. On the 30th of November 2023, the Council on Foreign Relations wrote, the Myanmar army could actually collapse. One week later, the national news reported, is Myanmar's ruling class on the brink of collapse? Are you sure about that? Look, I'm all for the efforts to bring back democracy in Myanmar. But I have to tell you the truth about the military situation on the ground. Yes, the ethnic militias have delivered a severe blow to the regime in Myanmar's northern Shan state, with the capture of dozens upon dozens of army outposts. However, the same cannot be said about rebel formations elsewhere in the country, where the Myanmar army performed much better. But of course, you won't hear about that in the media. When the article states most regime troops have lost the will to fight, this is false and extremely misleading. We're six months in and the Myanmar army is still fighting. So I don't think we should take at face value everything the opposition says. For example, there were many claims of mass surrender of Myanmar soldiers, but we have yet to see footage of all these thousands of POWs. The best way to describe the current situation of the Myanmar armed forces is... Not great, not terrible. So in this video, we'll study both guerrilla warfare tactics and counterinsurgency operations. The country that decided to take the gloves off. There's a lot to talk about. It's going to be a long and girthy one. So let's start with the part one and we'll focus on the part two later. Welcome to History Legends and here the latest news of the Myanmar Civil War. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. So how did it all start? Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, gained independence from British rule in 1948. Now check out the Myanmar conflict on Wikipedia. It started in April 1948. In other words, the country's ethnic minorities have been fighting against the central government ever since independence for at least 80 years. People were already talking about the Myanmar army fighting the rebels in the mountains in the 1980s. By the way, if you're interested in the origin story of the Myanmar Civil War, check out my video on how the Chinese nationalists used Burma as a springboard to reconquer mainland China. Long story short, in 2011, the dictatorship opened up a democratization process where democracy coexisted with military power. Free elections were held in 2015, and Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the NLD, won 58% of the votes. Fun fact, her father was an early-day nationalist, who sort of helped the Japanese take over Burma in 1942. Ah, details of history, right? In the 2020 general election, the NLD won 396 out of 476 seats in the parliament. The military quickly called results fraudulent, took over power, and arrested Aung San Suu Kyi. This led to major protests across the country, mainly with the student population. The military junta's repression campaign was brutal and caused up to 3,000 deaths. As always, cause and effect. By mid-2021, many of these protesters took up arms and joined rebel groups of the government in exile called the NUG or National Unity Government. However, they stood no chance since none of them actually had military experience. That's how they were trained by Myanmar's EAOs, 
or ethnic armed organizations who had been fighting against the junta for decades. Now let's analyze the belligerence in this conflict. The Burmese military is also called Tatmada, but we'll refer to them as government, regime, or junta troops. The great majority of regime active duty soldiers are recruited among ethnic Bamars that represent 68% of the population of Myanmar. Although many Bamars dislike the dictatorship, as we've seen with the 2021 protests, they also fear the consequences of a military takeover of the ethnic minorities. The Myanmar army has more or less tolerated armed insurgents operating in the country's hinterlands. But the latest raids into lowland areas inhabited by the Bamar majority is seen as unacceptable. In front of them stands the pro-democracy NGU, the government in exile, the National Unity Government. With its armed wing, the People's Defense Force, acronym PDF. I know, I agree, not the best acronym for search engine optimization. Most PDF recruits were young ethnic Bamars, students, city dwellers with no military experience. They ended up getting trained by the allied Kachin Independence Army operating north of the country. The Kachin people had suffered greatly from years of fighting the Myanmar army. But like Yoda training Luke Skywalker, they shared their teachings to the next generation. Now, the Kachin Independence Army is one of the many EAO's ethnic armed organizations. You see, every ethnic group in Myanmar basically has its own army. We have the Tang National Liberation Army, the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army in the north, which are ethnic Chinese, and the Arakan Army in the southwest. These three form the Three Brotherhood Alliance. Then in the north, we have the Shan State Army, composed of ethnic Shan people. Down south, the Karen people formed the Karen National Liberation Army and Kareni Nationalities Defense Force. Lastly, in Western Myanmar, the Chin people have their Chin National Defense Force and Chinland Defense Force. And together they fight with the People's Defense Forces against the Myanmar army. While the government in exile simply wants the return of democracy, the ethnic armed organizations don't want to return to a system where their minority voices will never be heard. In the end, they all want some form of autonomy as part of a federation. With that being said, there is a clear effort to integrate Bamars and PDF units within ethnic militias. Now let's talk about military operations. We'll study how the war is fought from the perspective of the guerrilla groups, but also how the government manages its counterinsurgency operations. In regards to the Myanmar army, the basic fighting unit is the battalion or Tat Yin in Burmese. The theoretical strength of regular battalions is 750 men. Meanwhile, they also developed more compact light infantry battalions which have around 500 military personnel each. As of the year 2000, there were 111 regular infantry battalions and 266 light infantry battalions. If you add border guards, internal security, and so on, we get an estimated 370,000 active duty personnel. On this map, you can see how the Myanmar army deployed all its battalions across the country. Their main objective was to protect this central corridor linking the major urban centers of Yangon, Naipidao, and all the way to Mandalay. We can clearly see how they deployed a great deal of troops in the highlands, on the periphery of the country, with the biggest density of battalions located in the most dangerous provinces. Now, before talking about the infamous Operation 1027, I have no choice but to start with the shaping operations that took place between March and September 2023. In the south of Myanmar, the Kareni troops are among the most organized and best equipped rebel formations. Like you can see here, most of them are well versed in the art of war. They wear camouflage uniforms and use modern weaponry. Kareni fighters benefit from their superior knowledge of the terrain. They conceal their movements inside the deep mountainous jungles, which allows them to launch surprise hit and run attacks and ambushes, all the while escaping regime counterattacks. Throughout 2023, the Karenis have been fighting to clear the Burmese-Thai border from army and police outposts. 
which leads me to believe that maybe they could be receiving supplies from Thailand. Coincidence, this region falls into the Golden Triangle, a region long known for its narco trafficking, where the warlords started growing opium to fund their activities. And surprise, surprise, by 2023, Myanmar had even overtaken Afghanistan in opium production. In early March 2023, 5,000 regular soldiers, supported by 5,000 of their local PNA ethnic militias, launched a multi pronged offensive across Kaya State. The objective was to take the insurgents around Demoso into a pincer, estimated at 12,000, of which only 5,500 were armed. But here's an interesting factor. As you can see, for every one ethnic militiaman fighting with the Myanmar army, there are two among the ranks of the Kareni resistance. Meaning local ethnic armed organizations don't have the full support of the local population. Pro-junta ethnic militias provide crucial intel to the military as you can see with this recon drone they launched to spy on rebel formations. But as you know, snitches get stitches. So for the Kareni rebels, the most important was to rally the entire Karen population to their cause, by force if necessary. In this video, a platoon of roughly 30 Kareni fighters attacked a blockhouse belonging to the PNA ethnic militia allied with the military government. The goal is to wipe out these isolated outposts, which can be considered soft targets compared to army bases. Here you can see PDF fighters ambushing a van, transporting pro-Myanmar army ethnic militias. It's a guerrilla war inside a guerrilla war. To this effect, AP reported, pro-government ethnic militias in East Myanmar shift loyalty to joint fighters against military rule. Now we can confirm that such events did happen. However, to what extent this is true? You just need to believe. In Kaya State, supported by airstrikes and artillery bombardments, multiple army columns attacked from the north and south in an attempt to dislodge Kareni units from the region. However, by late March, Kareni counterattacks inflicted heavy losses on junta columns. Here, a Kareni squad laid an ambush against an army patrol. And with the following drone footage, we can estimate 10 to 15 enemy fatalities. I mean, when you're part of these patrols, it's really black or white. Either you have zero casualties or everyone is gone. GG well played. Oh, by the way, massive disclaimer, beware of casualty reports. For example, in 2021, the Chin rebels claimed that at least 1000 Tatmada soldiers were KIA in clashes against them when they said they only lost 58 of their own. Yeah, press X for doubt. Meanwhile, on the 29th of March, a Kareni detachment attacked a police station. Their usual tactics is to creep their way across the mountainous jungle towards an isolated army or police outpost located on a hilltop. Once all the troops are in position, encircling the enemy outpost, they bombard the stronghold using mortars or man portable artillery. They like to use the M203 single shot 40mm underbarrel grenade launchers for the M16s they have. Otherwise, they like the good old M79 grenade launchers. Then they essentially fire in the direction of the enemy, charge uphill and overwhelm the defenders. In such a scenario, actual firefights last less than 5 minutes. Follow up junto assaults in April and May also failed to drive rebel fighters from the area. However, the continuous fighting led to a battle of attrition that became costly for the insurgents. The KNDF even admitted the death of one of their battalion commanders. By August, regime forces organized massive supply convoys, 80 to 120 vehicles, which were just too dangerous to attack for the rebels. For sure, they could strike and destroy a couple vehicles, but the immediate counterattacks of the army would be devastating. So Kareni units responded with hit-and-run attacks and demolition jobs behind enemy lines. This would ensure that the Myanmar army would constantly have to spread out its forces. Despite their best efforts, the commander of the KNDF admitted that his forces could not stop the regime's counterattacks, especially due to heavy air support and artillery strikes. While all this fighting was taking place in the southeast of the country, the government in exile with its PDF formations also launched devastating attacks in the northwest of the country in what we call the dry zone. Now you have to understand that 
The Myanmar army considers the People's Defense Forces as their main threat. The government in exile has the best claim to the throne and presents the strongest political opposition to the regime. On top of that, the PDF's main recruiting pool are ethnic Bamars. And if this keeps going, this could erode the regime's relationship with its main electoral base. In other words, the Myanmar regime will try to contain the ethnic minorities while they crush the PDF. So the junta dealt with the rebel groups of the People's Defense Forces in a very special way. Scorched Earth Tactics. Between May 2021 and May 2023, junta forces and their local proxies burned 53,000 homes in Sagang region alone. Any building suspected of helping or supplying the guerrillas was razed to the ground. They also displaced tens of thousands of people in order to separate the guerrilla from the population. Although these draconian methods did break up PDF formations. They did not stop roadside ambushes. These brutal tactics also led to an increase of hostility of the local population. In turn, the junta started getting problems in regards to intelligence gathering, and search and destroy missions became extremely difficult. Feeling the best defense is offense. The People's Defense Forces increased the rate of attacks against government positions. Continuous hit and run attacks were reported in Kani, Saudang, Yisagyo and Myung, just to name a few. Their political objective was to reach Mandalay, the country's second largest city. Because of the lack of natural cover in the country's dry zone, the PDF fighters make heavy use of motorized columns to evade government forces. Here we see a special mission where PDF troops attack a construction site where they end up stealing a couple of trucks which will then be used to approach army bases, all the while concealing 15 riflemen. In this video, you can see how the main assault was supported by three homemade mortars that seem as lethal for its operators as for the enemy. That's when the military junta changed tactics. The Myanmar army made sure to fully secure all the highways and major roads with a series of outposts and checkpoints. Junta forces also proved extremely effective at repairing roads or bridges after enemy demolition attacks. Then the map would be separated in sectors with highways as boundaries. Lastly, the junta with its mobile units calms one sector after another, all the while making sure no PDF formations and guerrillas can escape. Now in terms of the repression campaign, they actually decreased the burning of villages but increased atrocities against civilians. Are we the baddies? For example, a regime battalion would encircle a village. Soldiers would go inside the settlement with a list containing names of known PDF fighters. If the villagers helped the army identify them, the village would not be burned. However, if the residents do not cooperate no! to keep it PG, um, Machete, lots of machete, and uh, barbecue. Yeah, very barbaric atrocities. Everything in public display as a warning to the entire community. One important factor to remember was that army soldiers could directly communicate with the locals. Since they're all part of the Bamar ethnic majority of the country, since they don't need interpreters, every patrol is much more efficient in its mission. Eventually, the ring was closing on pro-democracy fighters. On the 25th of June 2023, a column of 50 army soldiers launched a search and destroy mission against the village of Kintao, where they eliminated an entire unit of 17 PDF fighters. Three days later, regime troops used intel from villagers and ambushed 14 guerrillas near Tailang. In early July, detachments of the 33rd Light Infantry Division launched a major operation against Myun Mu Township. 20,000 people were displaced and 200 homes were burned. Every victorious foray or raid would result in the elimination of an entire resistance cell. As a side note, to avoid roadside ambushes during their operations, the army made heavy use of the country's many rivers for its logistical needs. In the end, this terror campaign proved to be effective, as the People's Defense Forces were getting expelled from the dry zone. And their commanders were now worried of the army's increasingly precise intelligence of their whereabouts, suspecting many within their own ranks to be informants. Even worse, throughout the summer, government forces launched multiple attacks 
to free up the Bamo Mitkina Axis, dealing severe attrition to the local Kachin Independence Army in the process. If the Kachin rebels lose control of this region, especially the town of Nam San Yang, well, this would cut the supply lines towards their allies of the People's Defense Forces. Operation 1027. While the army was concentrating its efforts to eradicate the PDF in the dry zone, in June, generals from the Myanmar's junta held peace talks near the border with China with representatives of the Three Brotherhood Alliance. Spoilers, this was a rebel stratagem to gain time and to get some respite to lay the groundwork for a large-scale operation. As army bases in the north put down their guard, rebel columns stealthily advanced towards the front, like this one composed of over 200 men. On the 27th of October 2023, the Three Brotherhood Alliance launched major attacks in the Shan State in the northeast of Myanmar with an estimated 10,000 troops, codenamed Operation 1027. Get it? 10th month of the year, day 27. Listen, if one day in history class, they ask you the date of this operation, you cannot get it wrong or somebody's gonna get hurt real bad. As you can see on this map, the TNLA formations controlled these mountains and their allied MNDAA were positioned on the east side. Yeah, by the way, the third member of the alliance, the Arakan army, they didn't move. We should be rather talking about the two Brotherhood Alliance and the Coward. Just kidding, they will join, but later. The primary objective was probably the recapture of Lao Kang City, which was the former stronghold of the MNDAA, from where they got expelled in 2009 by a rival faction. The rebel formations left the cover of the mountainous jungle to attack urban areas in the valley. Most of the fighting took place along the roads linking Lashio to Muze, Monekoe, Lao Kang, and Chinche Weihao, meaning they were battling for control over the Chinese border. Diversionary attacks were launched against Lashio, Hichseni, and Aunkyo to divert the regime's attention elsewhere. But if successful, these would cut the army's lines of communications with the Chinese border. So in a way, it's kind of a win-win situation. The first position to fall was Chinche Weihao. Right after that, MNDAA formations stormed the city of Kulong on Highway 34 where they recorded some nice PR stunts and captured multiple armored vehicles and entire crates of ammunition. Fighting was also reported in the vicinity of Monekwe. In this video, you can see a rebel machine gun firing at an army outpost in that sector. Lastly, Junta soldiers wearing shorts and flip-flops seemed unsure of what to do next to repel the rebel attacks. That's when the battered Kachin Independence Army resurfaced and overran the village of Gangdaoyang on the 31st of October. Although the media portrayed Operation 1027 as a resounding victory for the rebels, we have to assess the situation realistically. The Myanmar army was outnumbered and their positions were greatly isolated. So more often than not, headquarters ordered its troops to abandon these outposts and regroup in larger bases. That's why the rebels reported to have captured so many positions, hundreds of outposts and checkpoints. Apart from all the PR stunts, the most important factor is that they did seize significant quantities of munitions and heavy weapons, which they can use to resupply and even create new rebel formations. With that being said, the Myanmar army only suffered a limited amount of casualties. With the momentum of all these large-scale operations in the north of the country, the People's Defense Forces also felt that it was the right time to act in order to regain the lost ground from the past months. From their new bases from northwest Myanmar, one offensive aimed at penetrating inside the dry zone and another was to slide down the Midha River Valley. That's how on November 5th, PDF troops attacked the town of Kale. Here you can see a squad regrouping behind a concrete wall. Some of them finally got their hands on tactical helmets and body armor. Two days later, PDF troops attacked the same valley but 100 kilometers to the south against Gangao. Meanwhile, also on the 7th of November, PDF units supported by their Kachin allies secured the settlement of Kaolin after four days of intense fighting. This marked a great victory for pro-democracy fighters. Kaolin was the first town in central Myanmar 
to fall to opposition forces since the coup of 2021. And here you can see some of the locals handing the PDF fighters some flowers to celebrate this moment. The following week, People's Defense Forces launched simultaneous attacks against Kanbaru and Yesagyo. The video I saw from the fighting in Kanbaru was truly shocking. Maybe 40 to 50 men from the Myanmar army ambushed in some rice fields. Let's say that the order of the day was... With ethnic armed organizations active throughout the entire country, even the PDF joined. The Arakan army, the third brother of the alliance, also went on the offensive on the 3rd of November. They launched a series of attacks against border guard and police units in Rakhine state. In response, just like in the north, the Myanmar army withdrew from 40 outposts and consolidated into better fortified strongholds all the while using their superior firepower to suppress rebel positions. Operation 1107 Inspired by the setbacks of junta positions in the northern Shan state, the Karini resistance also used this pressure's opportunity. That's how on the 7th of November they launched Operation, you guessed it, 1107. KNDF units attacked the border post in Meze, located less than 10 kilometers from the Thai border. During this battle, the army garrison was overwhelmed and reportedly suffered 70 fatalities for only four rebel fighters KIA. Apparently, some troops of the Myanmar army also switched sides just before the assault. Operation 11. 11. It seems the attack on Meze was a diversion. Four days later, on the 11th of November, the main assault of the Kareni National Defense Force aimed at capturing Loika, the capital of Kaya State. Remember how in the summer of 2023, Kareni troops withheld the army's attacks near Demoso, which was located only 15 kilometers south of Loikau. This time, the KNDF achieved operational surprise by pushing into Loikau from the north with hidden reserves. The capture of the state capital by the rebels could signal to many people across the country that the tide is turning. By the 15th of November, Kareni rebels stormed Loikau University Rebel snipers specifically targeted junta officers to disrupt the chain of command and lower morale of the rank and file. During the battle for the university, Kareni troops claimed to have defeated the entirety of the Light Infantry Battalion 425 and half the strength of Light Infantry Battalion 6, inflicting a total of 100 fatalities. From the videos I saw of this battle, this seems to be the correct number of losses for the army. Here you can see 8 Kareni fighters equipped with AKs and RPGs resting between two firefights. Think about it, some of these guys probably attended classes in that same university one or two years before. At the same time, they would know the layout of the place by heart. Like in this frame where this squad is seen clearing the building floor by floor. During this battle, the rebels claim to have captured 32 soldiers, which once again can be confirmed with the following footage. And this is how a KNDF battalion commander convinced a group of cornered junta soldiers to lay down their weapons. Oh! During this firefight, they also captured 128 weapons, as you can see on screen. In a later report, a total of 38 Myanmar army troops had surrendered. So once again, we don't see a complete collapse and demoralization of regime units. The problem of the KNDF is enemy airstrikes against which they have no proper weapons. By the 23rd of November, the fighting had reached downtown Loikau. Meanwhile, to disrupt the logistics of the enemy, and the arrival of more reinforcements, other KNDF detachments cleared the army and police outposts, checkpoints all around Loikau. In this video, you can see how they infiltrated enemy positions using a small stream inside the jungle. From there, under suppressive fire, they advanced towards the military checkpoint. Some more POWs were also captured. To fully capture Loikau, Kareni forces will need to storm the regional headquarters, which is defended by hundreds of soldiers. This urban battle of attrition could at best end in a Pyrrhic victory for the KNDF. Conclusion 
the Myanmar army's early decision to abandon many of its combat positions, stained its reputation but left the bulk of its forces intact. I read that by the 28th of November, the three Brotherhood Alliance captured 80 bases and a total of 220 junta positions and checkpoints, and captured scores of much-needed weapons and ammunition. But they have not defeated the Myanmar military. So far, they have overrun the headquarters of 4 out of 46 battalions stations in northern Shan state. The big problem is that opposition forces are not truly cooperating, since they all have vastly different political objectives. For example, the Three Brotherhood Alliance launched Operation 1027 on their own. It did not involve a united, pre-planned, coordinated effort of all opposition groups across the country. So from their central position, the Myanmar army could contain all of these offensives and defeat the enemy in detail. That's why I find articles like this one saying how the Myanmar military is facing death by a thousand cuts to be a big exaggeration. Stay tuned for part two. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The link is in the description below.